Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you're joining us today. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. If you do not consent to being recorded, you are asked to drop off the meeting at this time. Thank you. All righty, um, we will go ahead and get the webinar started. Uh, my name is Tyler Doherty, and I'm the Director of Public Health Policy and Programs here at the National Indian Health Board. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the long COVID-19 webinar and where we will focus on the effects and recovery of long haul COVID or long COVID. Long COVID-19 appears weeks after infection and can occur in anyone who has had COVID-19 even if their illness was mild or if they had no symptoms. Post-COVID symptom conditions are a wide range of new, returning, or ongoing health problems. People can experience long COVID or post-COVID symptoms for weeks after first being infected with the virus that causes COVID-19 or symptoms can last for months after testing positive for the virus. Another term being used is long haulers. Long haulers are people who have not fully recovered from COVID-19 weeks or months after first experiencing symptoms. Although most people with COVID-19 get better within weeks of illness, some people experience post-COVID conditions. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the most common lasting symptoms are fatigue, shortness of breath, cough, joint pain, and chest pain. Other issues include cognitive problems. For instance, researchers identified COVID-associated brain damage months after infection, including in the region linked to smell, and the changes were linked to cognitive decline in the study. Other long COVID symptoms can include difficulty concentrating, depression, muscle pain, headache, rapid heartbeat, and intermittent fever. During the COVID-19 pandemic, American Indians and Alaska Natives were hit hard by COVID-19, and some may experience long COVID. Information shared today can assist tribal communities as they continue to fight COVID-19 and be prepared for the future as the virus becomes endemic. After this webinar, we will be hearing from Dr. Alla during this webinar, I apologize, we will be hearing from Dr. Allison Kellyher, Director of the PBRN ACORN American Indian Collaborative Research Network and Assistant Professor at the Clinician Scholarly Scholar Department of Family Medicine and Community Medicine and Population Health at the University of North Dakota. Thank you so much, Dr. Kellyher, for joining us today and thank you for your leadership during this pandemic. Our discussion today is extremely important. The information shared today will be used to continue COVID-19 response efforts for tribes and native families across the country. We will start the webinar with a presentation from Dr. Kellyher, and from there we will move into our question and discussion session. I am now honored to turn the floor over to Dr. Allison Kellyher. Thank you so much. Dahatne, it's a pleasure and an honor to join you. It's really wonderful to serve on the board of the Association of American Indian Physicians who works closely with the National Indian Health Board. So I'm really honored to be here. I was named my Inupiaq name in Nome, Alaska. My name comes from King Island. Allison Kelleher Sayuza. I am Dana or Koyakon Athabaskan. I follow my mother's clan line. I'm originally from Alaska and currently in Grand Forks, North Dakota. So I'll share my screen here with you. And I want to honor that today the University of North Dakota rests on the ancestral lands of the Pembina and Red Lake bands of the Ojibwe and Do Dakota Oyate, presently existing as composite parts of the Red Lake, Turtle Mountain, White Earth Bands, and the Dakota tribes of Minnesota and North Dakota. 
we acknowledge the people who resided here for generations and recognize that the spirit of the Ojibwe and Oyate people permeates this land. As a university community, we will continue to build upon our relations with the First Nations of the state of North Dakota, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation, Sisseton, Wapiton, Oyate Nation, Spirit Lake Nation, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, and the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. I'd like to invite you to silently honor the land keepers where you join us from today as we are so blessed and lucky to unite together to talk story around COVID-19. I know that for my family in particular, we are one of three families that survived the 1918 pandemic time. And so it's really an honor that we can come together, talk story and share story. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about what chronic long haul COVID looks like, um, talk some about vaccines, uh, explore recent studies, talk about some studies. And I'd like to emphasize uh, traditional remedies and awareness of traditional models that can help to build resiliency in regards to addressing COVID-19. I'd also like to honor Philip Albert, who gifted me my eagle feather that you see there with our traditional calendar beaded um, into it. So if I look back to when I first became interested in becoming a physician, it was because I fell ill as a teenager. And I found that information I could find in the library or from natural healers was really helpful to me. And I became frustrated that science wasn't what was practiced in medicine. So that's kind of brought me from being a clinician. I'm a family physician. I'm double boarded in integrative and holistic medicine, but I also am a traditional healer. And what's interesting to me is when I got sick as a teenager, uh, I started having visions, imagery, and really started my journey uh, to becoming a traditional healer by looking to elders and knowledge bearers within my community. What I learned is that our people go into a deep sleep when we become medicine people. It took me 40 years to learn that, but uh, nonetheless, it was worth the wait to understand that uh, the Western model says that we get viruses. And for me, that meant that I became a medicine person ultimately as um, recognized by my community and defined my by my community. So viruses can be acute or chronic. They can recur. And in particular, I had Epstein-Barr virus. We'll talk about how Epstein-Barr and coronavirus may play a role together. And we'll also talk about how we're working to be inclusive with research so that it includes indigenous voice perspectives and maybe even traditional remedies. I have experience with research at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda and also at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and researching heart disease in Alaska Natives. But I started training in pre-kindergarten as a traditional healer. One of my main teachers, Rita Blumenstein, told of a prophecy that in the future, the white raven would return and that would be the time of our medicine to come back. So my patients have been giving me pictures of white raven for about the past 15 years and, and it is time for our medicine to come back. Just so you know a little bit more about me, I've also studied global healing traditions, have acupuncture, Ayurveda, uh, knowledge and supplements and botanicals um, globally to a certain degree. Although I don't know everything about plants, they're mysterious and wonderful. Um, uh, the way I think about plants is they have their whole pharmacy inside their bodies and because uh, they can't move around like we can. So they have to have antivirals, antibacterials, antifungals, et cetera. Um, so what I'd really like to do is build upon our strengths in, within indigenous communities to help improve our health. And um, I work here at the University of North Dakota with Dr. Nicole Redvers, who was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So as an overview in regards to COVID, we're reminded that community-driven interventions are effective and Alaska Native and American Indian people have been fairly successful in becoming vaccinated 
Um, and we took more control of our vaccines and vaccine distribution. However, despite that, we've suffered from higher death rates, mortality rates that are 2.5 times higher than the average American um, public. Uh, we have higher infection rates and four times the hospitalization rates. We've really had to deal with a history of untrustworthy behavior in the scientific community and remedying that by being more involved in our own uh, control of our research studies and um, having culturally appropriate messaging, such as some of the stuff I'll show you with AAIP, the Association of American Indian Physicians coming up here. And the kind of messaging we've been working on is how to protect each other, how we're all interconnected, just like we are through grandmother's spider web uh, through the internet right now, connecting all people across the world, um, but that we need to protect our elders, our young ones, and really warrior up with a more collective approach. So I just want to honor her uh, team and her work there. Also, I'm collaborating with Chip Manis, who's been studying some of the long haul uh, COVID out of the University of Florida. And what he's found is that folks who are hospitalized for COVID can become um, are at high risk for hospitalization for at least a year after their initial hospitalization. And they're not hospitalized for COVID symptoms, they're hospitalized for their underlying conditions, such as worsening of diabetes, or maybe uh, kidney or heart or other conditions that we wouldn't necessarily have thought were related to their COVID or maybe are a worsening of their underlying COVID. So we have a lot of research to do as far as delineating how to best um, how to best care for folks, which is why we really need to get involved in research. So vaccines are thought to reduce the risk of long COVID by lowering the chance of uh, getting the infection to begin with and having a lower viral load. But people do have breakthrough infections and studies suggest that you might have half of the risk of getting long haul COVID if you're vaccinated. However, science isn't perfect, right? So in some studies, we find that people can still get long haul COVID um, even with vaccines. So we need to understand this and um, by doing further inquiry, further studies, well-designed studies. And that's part of my job here at the American Indian Collaborative Research Network. Just so you know, practice-based research networks are uh, organized across our country and globally to help address community health concerns. So PBRNs are ways that we can influence policy, organize regionally, nationally, or by populations to address our health needs. And we're organized by the Agency for Healthcare Research. And what we want to do is get the science into practice to help people today. The National Institutes of Health is also working on reducing structural racism by understanding stakeholder experiences, um, creating new research and health disparities. All of these things are called the UNITE initiative. And we wanna create transparency and uh, foster a, a um, meaningful, open and collaborative research ecosystem. So we're trying to address some of the uh, historical wrongdoings in science to include indigenous people. We want to increase awareness and engagement, build and improve research infrastructure, engage local communities, and develop uh, better science of being inclusive. This is an example of the Association of American Indian Physicians relevant messaging. So this is my friend Dave Baines. Um, who I've been in ceremony with and is my teacher. He's now a retired family physician, he Plinkett and uh, Simpson up in Alaska. And uh, so that's, that's just an example of his vaccines and the vaccine promotion and COVID awareness that we've been working on online. But I just wanna remind you on this slide that if you are a patient or have symptoms that I am not your personal physician or provider, so be sure to consult your personal provider if you have concerns, because this is a general overview for information, not for your individual health per se. Post-COVID conditions are this umbrella term that refer to physical and mental health as we've already um, discussed and thank you so much for that overview when we got started. So even if patients don't have symptoms from the COVID, they can still get 
the chronic long haul COVID. And that's a little bit complicated, isn't it? Um, there are different names for post-COVID. Post-acute sequelae of COVID is another term, PASC, P-A-S-C. That means symptoms that happen from the COVID sequelae are symptoms that linger. Um, and long haul uh, COVID is another term. So we're still working on the terminology. It makes it hard to study if we don't all agree on a term. So we're working on it. There are different patterns that occur in people. Uh, and these may be due to genetics, the genetics of the COVID virus that infects us, or maybe the genetics of the individual or the genetics that are expressed, possibly as influenced by other viruses or environmental factors. So this is really complex. Some of us can overreact to COVID, some of us can underreact to COVID, and both of those scenarios can cause illness. In some studies, up to 30% of people who have had a positive COVID test developed chronic symptomology. It can affect children and adolescents. And um, we think that certain, um, certain subgroups of possibly people or possibly infections can cause more high risk for COVID. So that's uh, for chronic COVID-19 symptoms. So it's important to study that. Most importantly in practice, so I still have a private practice and see patients, and what is most important is that we listen to our patients. A lot of patients uh, seek out care from a holistic or integrated provider such as me because we specialize in listening. Uh, so there are some specialty centers nationally where we can refer to. Those wait lists are long but that's something to consider if you're a provider. And also we have to be aware of not overburdening our system with over-testing because test, medical tests and such can also result in harm. So if we find something that isn't really a problem, an incidental loma, and then treat that, it can cause harm. So this is a balancing act in medicine. Basically, we start to suspect post-acute sequelae of COVID or long-haul COVID after four weeks, and certainly are, are uh, definitively concerned after 12 weeks. In addition to those symptoms already mentioned, the shortness of breath and fatigue, post-exertional malaise is very typical for viruses, uh, as is brain fog. Cough, chest pain, and headache can occur. Palpitations and tachycardia may be related to autonomic dysfunction or the um, sympathetic nervous system being affected. And I'll talk to you a bit about postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, POTS, P-O-T-S, here in a minute. Uh, arthralgias, that's joint pain, myalgias, muscle pain, um, abnormal sensations. So my abnormal sensations when after I had my COVID wild type virus were feeling water running on my lower extremities when I would wash my hands. It was very disconcerting. It resolved. Um, abdominal pain, diarrhea, a sense that folks aren't completely evacuating their stools have been associated with uh, post-COVID insomnia, sleep dysregulation, and sleep difficulties, um, fever, lightheadedness, uh, impaired function, pain, rash, especially hives. I have seen some people with, um, with uh, bacterial infections as well. Mood changes, smell and taste changes, and menstrual cycle irregularities are also associated with the chronic long haul COVID. And some of, I wanted to list all of those because I think it's important we're aware of all of those symptoms because it's very uh, broad and very and uh, varies from person to person as well. So there can be many different types of diseases or illnesses that can also happen from chronic COVID, inflammation of the heart, um, and this thing called, so that's myocarditis or actually damage to the heart with heart failure, pericarditis inflammation around the heart sac, or this thing called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. This typically is exacerbated by heat. So people will be washing dishes or get in the shower and then post this after their shower, boy, they are real, real tired, need to lay down for a while. So I'll screen my patients for that. I'll also screen them for lightheadedness or passing out. So any symptoms of fainting or feeling lightheaded probably needs a referral to a cardiologist, possibly for a tilt test and further workup. 
lung disease is what I've seen also uh, with or without hypoxia. So interstitial lung disease or reactive airway disease sometimes can benefit from albuterol or other treatment can be diagnosed with a, a CT or pulmonary function test. Chronic kidney disease, loss of hair is real common. So people experiencing that resetting from the stress of the infection, resetting of their um, the timing on their hair growth and um, hair starting to regrow all at the same time. So it's really disconcerting to patients, but I noticed that it improves over time. Reactive arthritis, fibromyalgia, and connective tissue disease. These are all things that are also associated with Epstein-Barr virus or some other chronic viruses. Diabetes can occur as well as hypothyroidism. So we're thought that we think this is through autoimmune um, mechanisms and uh, transient ischemic attacks. That means a mini stroke or a cerebrovascular accident, trouble with smelling. Uh, we mentioned the sleep memory impairment, um, but also PTSD, anxiety, depression, or psychosis can occur. So early on in the COVID pandemic, I heard of a particular individual who suffered from a viral infection a week later, what he said to his mom over and over again was, I want chicken nuggets, no matter what she asked him. So he ended up in the psychiatry office and was diagnosed with COVID, but that would be a really unusual symptom. Who would think that just repeating that or maybe having um, psychosis, a disconnection from reality might go along with COVID or chronic COVID. Anyways, um, incontinence or sexual dysfunction, I have seen that occur in uh, one of my thousand patients. Um, it seems more rare, but weight loss um, and reactivation of viruses with pain syndromes, hearing loss and vertigo can also occur. So we need to be aware it's very pleomorphic. It can look for lots of different ways. This is to flesh out the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. There is a way to diagnose this in the clinic and you get what's called orthostatic vital signs. So patients lie down for five minutes, you record their blood pressure and heart rate. They stand for one minute, do the same. And then they stand for three minutes and you record these things. If there's a drop in their systolic blood pressure or the blood pressure number that's on top, of greater than 20 millimeters of mercury or the diastolic, which is the bottom number of greater than 20 mil or rather greater than 10 millimeters of mercury, or they experience lightheadedness or, I, or um, have an increase in heart rate above 30 beats per minute, it's concerning. And that can be definitively diagnosed by a cardiologist. And I've had a lot of luck getting people diagnosed. The treatment for POTS is salt in general. There's other treatments as well, but people need to hydrate and have salt. I've seen a couple folks that are so severe, they need IV fluids. Anyways, um, here's some ways to work up chronic COVID. Um, so you just get the appropriate test for their symptoms, okay? But I wanted to highlight here in yellow that vitamin D and vitamin B12 um, are some commonly overlooked and vitamin deficiencies that can contribute, we think, to chronic uh, COVID-19. Just a word about people who have pulmonary or lung symptoms that sometimes um, uh, chest CT or um, further imaging, especially if they have shortness of breath um, or low oxygen uh, can be helpful. And they, we are working on diagnoses universally internationally. So there is a U09.9 post-COVID-19 condition on specified that the World Health Organization is working on. In the meantime, the Centers for Disease Controls recommends a B98.4 sequelae of other specified infectious or parasitic diseases. Big picture, what predisposes us to viruses? Well, these are natural phenomenon. I kind of think of them as lunar landing modules in our environment that have an ability to communicate with our cells and replicate within our cells. So if underlying disease and imbalance exists, um, and from the indigenous perspective, that balance can uh, is really important, right? Um, so whether that's all four directions or from the Athabascan perspective, the sky, the water, and the earth, all being in balance, um, then we have health. 
Uh, but if we're out of balance, then of course we can uh, be vulnerable to these underlying viruses that are in our environment. Now, this is a brand new virus, the COVID-19. So uh, we're still learning about it and we'll continue to do that. Um, if we don't sleep enough or are stressed, which all of us are right now due to a lack of social um, connectedness, and uh, grief, um, we're vulnerable to viruses. So we must learn how to be more resilient and uh, work together to support each other. Poor nutrition can lead to those underlying vitamin deficiencies. For example, uh, whale skin or muktuk from up north or fish skin has vitamin D. So if you're not eating that kind of stuff, we might be vitamin deficient and need to replenish. Um, there's also evidence that vitamin C, vitamin A, and maybe zinc can play a role with viruses. Underlying conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, or others can predispose us to illness with virus, autoimmune conditions, and lots of medicines such as steroids or other uh, medications that people take for autoimmune disease can influence our tendency to get a virus. I want to talk about Epstein-Barr virus. Remember I told you that I've had both Epstein-Barr when I was a teenager, um, that's intermittently caused me some, um, some illness, but much worse after the COVID-19. So, so for me, I've had Epstein-Barr and then COVID-19 and I have to, I have to be aware of my Epstein-Barr so that I can feel well enough. So Epstein-Barr is a type of herpes virus that causes a glandular fever. So this goes all over in your body and a lot of the time people get sore throat, but it stays in your immune cells and can reactivate in over your life. It has a similar mechanism to how it causes illness and that's through the B cells or our adaptive humoral immunity. And that's similar to COVID-19, interestingly. What is key is 95% of humans have had Epstein-Barr virus. So if, if we just have had Epstein-Barr or mono and then we get COVID, the thought is, man, that might predispose us to long haul COVID. Epstein-Barr virus is also associated with lots of other illnesses, including some cancers, um, but also autoimmune conditions. And in this one study, 185 people were randomized, and we found that nearly 70% of people who had long haul COVID were positive for Epstein-Barr virus reactivation compared to 10% of those um, who, who didn't have long haul COVID. So that's um, really important to acknowledge that people with long haul COVID in the study are more likely to have had Epstein-Barr virus. So there are ways to test for Epstein-Barr. This is really where my integrative and holistic medicine comes in because not a lot of mainstream um, physicians are testing for Epstein-Barr virus, but that is in my armamentarium of what I'm trained to do as a holistic doctor board certified in integrative medicine. So we would test for Epstein-Barr virus serologies, um, viral capsid antigen, and different tests um, to see if there it can be Epstein-Barr virus that's reactivated, or sometimes I'll just treat clinically. So if a patient has a history like me of being sick in the past with mono, and then they have long haul COVID, if the treatment is fairly natural, what you'll see it is, then I'm inclined to treat patients with healthy diet, lots of rest, appropriate exercise, and um, perhaps some supplements and traditional remedies. Mostly what we have to do is listen and create a plan for individuals that works with them and is holistic. So it's interesting that after all this time in medicine, um, at developing all these high high tech remedies. Here we are with this COVID-19 and the treatment needs to be holistic. Isn't that interesting? So immune support from nutrition, that's high antioxidants. I think about our uh, wild greens, our berries in Alaska. And um, these are really high in micronutrients and phytomedicines, especially vitamin C, D, zinc, and mushroom extracts. So this would include things like chaga, C-H-A-G-A. -A. That's our traditional um, 
uh, birch fungus that we use as a tonic for healing. So chaga mushroom um, or other uh, medicines, they list echinacea here, but there's, um, which is a traditional plant medicine uh, from around these places in, in the plains. It's a traditional American Indian plant medicine. Also things that are adaptogens or help us adapt to stress. Uh, so ours would be called um, devil's club up north, or that's our kind of wild ginseng that helps us adapt to stress. Um, holy basil or chaga mushrooms would also help us adapt to stress. And there can be natural antivirals. The one I use the most is loracidin or monolaurin. I use that because it's a coconut derivative and inhibits uh, the Epstein-Barr virus in a healthy, um, in a healthy way. St. John's wort, which is another American Indian um, plant, as well as olive leaf extract that's from uh, Europe, and lemon balm, L-lysine, and others, including licorice root, can be helpful. So we have to consider that different uh, populations of people may be affected differently by chronic long haul COVID. Perhaps that's genetic, perhaps it's environmental, perhaps it's a combination. People with diabetes or rather disabilities, homelessness, um, people who are in where, um, who are warehoused or in big houses such as correctional facilities or nursing homes, pre-existing substance abuse and those in rural areas that are disproportionately unvaccinated may be affected. And also folks who just have difficulty accessing care, particularly holistic and integrative care, which is called upon for, treat for treating this illness. So we're currently underway in researching COVID-19 chronic long haul symptoms. And um, there's this thing called the PASC initiative, P-A-S-C. So the Recover PASC study is a, a multi-center trial that I'm honored to serve on the community advisory board for. And uh, this national study will look at um, adults and children and um, we have the full support of the NIH to, to help us, um, Francis Collins and uh, the whole team at the National Institutes of Health, uh, to support us in uncovering the causes and treatments for chronic long-haul COVID. There's the website recovercovid.org if you want to find a research site near you to be involved. Here for the uh, NIH Recover PASC study, we are enrolling patients at Sanford Health Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I would just like to honor our leadership and their awareness, um, Dr. Warren and uh, Un University of North Dakota President Armacost for their leadership throughout this, this pandemic. So how do we treat this? Well, Let's consider our eight dimensions of wellness if we want to uh, be aware of holistic treatment. So that includes our emotional, financial, social, spiritual, occupational, physical, intellectual, and environmental health. So it makes a lot of sense to me as an indigenous person that our wellness is related to our earth's wellness. If, if mother earth is in balance and father sky, then we're more likely to be healthful. Um, and you can see how all of us maybe have different strengths and weaknesses and can rely on each other to fill in the gaps for these eight dimensions of wellness. I also feel like this is related to the medicine wheel. This is another way to look at um, uh, uh, the pyr a pyramid of health and how the foundation of health is our food, maybe even our traditional foods, um, organic, whole, real foods, not food-like substances. More plants than not are often encouraged. Um, exercise, being aware that chemicals and pollutants in our environments can contribute to illness, uh, our structural integrity, and stress. So this image comes from the Holistic Breast Health website, and I, I really feel like this is helpful. It kind of re- uh, it kind of harkens to Maslow's hierarchy, which is based on uh, 
Blackfeet um, traditions as well. So just another pyramid here to be aware that this is Dr. Weil's anti-inflammatory food pyramid. Really helpful because Dr. Weil is the father of integrative medicine. And when I got sick in the 90s, I sure learned about him and later met him and have worked with his uh, co-workers nationally and, and uh, spent time at his program. So this is a pyramid, food pyramid you can find online. I've um, I've outlined some things that I feel are particularly relevant from the traditional Alaska Native or American Indian perspective. Um, looking at how we minimize toxins and maximize nutrients and phytomedicines. So maximize the amount of healthy healing that we get from our food. So I would like to highlight vitamin D. We can get that from our traditional diet. Even dandelions have vitamin D, but we can also supplement. Teas such as yarrow or artemisia. Um, I brought some artemisia. This is our sage or it's related to mugwort or stinkweed. So that's our antiviral um, herbs, proteins, healthy proteins such as eggs or our traditional meats. Um, Mushrooms, such as chaga, again, uh, fish, nuts, seeds, beans, vegetables, and berries. So our traditional diets and lifestyles were in and of themselves anti-inflammatory, and we're in the process of remembering that. So as an overview, high antioxidants foods that are colorful vegetables and fruits, um, maybe five to 11 handfuls a day. Foods rich in beta carotene, orange vegetables especially, and minimal grains and sugars can help to reduce inflammatory system stress and improve nutrient density. I'd like to honor my teacher, Terry Moreska. Uh, she's a physician for teaching and sharing with me uh, plant medicines and for doing the, the good work at the University of Washington School of Medicine. So our wellness is related to environmental health, clean on polluted air, water, and land. All of our relatives and balance are important and we have a long way to go. We have traditional knowledge for addressing balance and really what we've done during the COVID-19 pandemic is we've done a lot of social distancing, whereas what we should have been doing is physical distancing and we really need social connectedness and that sense of community and belonging are medicine from my perspective. So um, methods such as this, uh, you know, the internet and other things have been really, really helpful for us to maintain that balance and we have more work to do there. So all of the models we just talked about can be summarized or illustrated here in the medicine wheel. So the medicine wheel balances body, mind, spirit, and emotion. It also takes us through the journey of all aspects of our life and development and can be used as a, a model for achieving health and wellness. I just uh, wanted to uh, also mention that in this reference, we can use the medicine wheel to be individualized to communities. And uh, in this particular reference, there were over 200 indigenous, um, indigenous elders and knowledge bearers who were working together to remind us about the medicine wheel and its, and its healing powers. So uh, as we get ready to summarize here, a balance of food, exercise, stress management, and sleep are necessary. And we should still be mindful of things like wearing our masks when we're in high um, infection rate areas, uh, washing our hands, and social distancing when necessary. I'm also reminded that we're each on our own journey and we're all related to each other. So even though all of our stories are individualized throughout this pandemic, it, it everybody's story is important and interrelated. I'd like to thank the University of North Dakota's Department of Indigenous Health, who's been supporting me through this time in um, science and also the Association of American Indian Physicians for connecting me to the National Indian Health Board in this opportunity. 
there are some resources on the CDC website, especially consider the NIH workshops for the post-acute sequelae of COVID or the past long haul COVID. And I want to honor our ancestors and leadership. Um, Nez Pierce Chief Joseph said, treat all men alike, give them the same law, give them an even chance to live and grow. And what I hope is that we can have an inclusive uh, type of science that allows us to be included and to be aware of how chronic COVID-19 affects ourselves, our communities, and our neighbors. Anamasi, thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly, Herb, for that wonderful presentation. I know I learned a lot uh, from, from that content. Um, and just to reiterate, I know we've had some questions pop up. Uh, this recording will be um, uploaded to the NIHB YouTube uh, page. Uh, so please make sure that you follow the NIHB YouTube page to receive automatic notifications when new uh, resources are uploaded. Um, this recording will be uploaded um, by the end of next week. Uh, so um, check back around that time uh, to, to re-watch this wonderful presentation. So, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, there was a lot of great information shared just now. And, <clears throat> you know, we're going to start our question and answer uh, portion of this webinar now. Um, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand so that you can be unmuted. And you may also type your questions into the Q&A chat box. Uh, to, kick, to kick us off, we have a couple questions that were submitted ahead of time, uh, and, and we're going to begin with those questions, and then I see um, we have a couple hands raised, Madeline, Fran, and Candy. Um, I will ask your questions after we ask um, a couple of our pre-submitted questions. So, um, does COVID-19 vaccination play a role in preventing long COVID? I know you touched on that in your presentation, but I wanted to uh, revisit that question. Thank you so much. It probably does. COVID vaccine probably does decrease the chances of developing chronic long haul COVID, but large longitudinal studies uh, have not necessarily been done. So we still don't know definitively for sure that vaccine prevents chronic long haul COVID. We know that certainly, certainly long haul COVID can occur with vaccination. We don't know how often. Hope that makes sense as science turns. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelleher. E -E. Is it possible that long COVID will be considered a chronic disease? It does seem quite possible and science and uh, medicine work together in a slow way. So you saw that the World Health Organization is creating a designation for chronic long haul COVID as a diagnosis. The United States has not yet created that, but we do have a diagnosis for chronic virus, chronic disease. Um, so yes, it will very likely be a diagnosis in my opinion or would from what the experts say. Thank you. Um, how can loved ones support friends or family who might be suffering from long COVID? Listen, listen and think of resources, help them identify resources. There are lots of online forums or group forums that have been very helpful for my patients who are debilitated by this. Um, and really seeing a provider. So seeing a provider that listens to you is super important. So uh, my sister-in-law has POTS and I listened to her and said, man, sounds like you might need to see a cardiologist. Guess what? It really helped her. So she's seen a cardiologist for her POTS. And we're, I listen, help them process because they might have brain fog and they might have trouble problem solving. So I try to encourage them to see the provider and maybe go in with their with them to their provider. And sometimes it's hard because it's not just one provider, then it's going to be multiple providers. So then it's the primary care provider, the cardiologist, the neurologist. Ugh. 
So with all of these specialists, I'd say help to provide support as best you can. And um, also consider those, uh, remembering those traditional remedies, traditional life ways and practices, your traditional healers, um, and talk to your elders and foster community as much as you can to minimize isolation. Thank you so much. I think, I think oftentimes the act of listening may not feel like you are doing everything you can to support someone, but just by lending your ear, uh, your time, your support, uh, it, it can really be um, a wonderful way to be able to uplift individuals who might be suffering. Um, is it possible for someone who suffers from long COVID to get COVID-19 again? Yeah. Um, it is, I can speak from personal experience, uh, unfortunately. So I got sick in early March of, you know, uh, 2020, I guess. And then, um, we didn't have good tests available at that time. And I had this chronic long haul syndrome it took me about nine months to feel like I was back to myself completely. And um, then I've had a, a couple of other infections. So, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, it does. Yeah, unfortunately, um, we don't understand what predisposes us to these things. So we're still working it out could be genetics of your of the virus that infected you could be our genetics and our underlying maybe other infections like Epstein Barr. Great, thank you so much. And Candy, uh, Cornelius, I have asked you to unmute. You should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question at this time. Yes, uh, Candy Cornelius from the Oneida Nation. Allison, I really, really liked your uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Um, here in Oneida, uh, we are fortunate. I am a community health nurse, so I was doing the contact tracing. Um, so obviously dove in deep on a professional level. Um, so it was really nice to hear, and I wonder if other providers or it would be me almost as a contact tracer telling people to get a post-COVID exam. And it really was not a known thing. So I think maybe throughout Indian country, we need to, I guess, send that message out to people. Um, and then on a personal level, I had family members with COVID who got really sick and I encouraged them um, to be seen. And just like you said, a couple of the, the new diagnoses popped up. One had hyperthyroidism, uh, one had, you know, the alopecia. And, you know, like, like you said, it was months after having COVID. So I really think it's important to promote that post-exam. Not everybody likes to go to the doctor, yes, but, you know, it was getting my relatives like, please just go in and get blood drawn, you know, because, you know, that extreme fatigue, the brain fog, I mean, some of it was interfering with their daily life, you know, so um, I just want to make that point that it's important and that we promote that in Indian country to get that a full exam, a post-COVID exam after you have it. And then here in Oneida too, um, personally for uh, my family and some of my friends, we did combine um, the, some native medic medication, native remedies, um, that my um, uncle was able to share with us. And um, it really helped a lot of my family members. It really did. So That's the great. traditional medicine is near and dear to my heart. I'm always, you know, promoting Western medicine and in combination with traditional. So it was so great to hear another perspective. Way from North, North Dakota, I wish you were closer. <laughs> yeah, I really love to, yeah, I'd really love to hear um, more about, uh, and then I have a relative too who is really interested in kind of the work you do. So I might just share your email and contact information with her. Um, so it was about promoting the post exam. Um, I didn't know if you knew like the rate, or, you know, how is there a rate? I know we can't really, we don't have a big population of the long haul who actually are developing it. Yeah. And then as a provider, how do you differentiate? So say one of my relatives goes in yeah. and boom, she has hyperthyroidism. How do, how do you know and connect that too? Um, yeah, it, you can that's kind a, of a, you can get titers or yeah, you can get what you can get viral titers, right? So I could try to pull the, um, FST or the coronavirus, um, immune globulins and see if 
for like three to six months after infection, they might be positive. But to tell you the truth, those can be false positives because coronavirus is a cold virus. So sorry, I know way too much for my own good. And sometimes I talk myself into a circle, but basically you can get the test that shows that you've had a recent infection, which would increase your concern that they have an autoimmune cause from the COVID-19, but it's not definitive hundred percent causal because it could be a false positive. Um, but yeah. having said that, what I do is look at symptom symptomology. Remember I said, don't test too much. Sometimes we got to use our clinical brain. So for me, if I have somebody that two months ago had bad COVID or just, you know, COVID and they were down and back to work, and then they have like a thyroid storm with palpitations and they need to go get a big workup, um, then I'm likely to think that this is uh, COVID caused. And so I have that dialogue with my patients. What we're going to do in the studies is we're going to follow it live time from now on, right? So as people are diagnosed with COVID as time goes by, we'll be able to follow their disease and see what actually happens with them. Hope that answered your question, Candy, and I'm happy to do more collaboration around traditional medicine because uh, it's important time is of the essence to help yes. us preserve and practice. So you're saying if it, a diagnosis comes with say hyperthyroidism, you said post COVID, you would test COVID titers at that time, I and can. that, uh, that yep. would be the positive factor. It, it, could, it could be positive, and, but it's not 100% that it is causative because you can have a false positive. If I got a test right now for COVID and it was positive on my titers, that might be because I had a cold virus. Buggy. Okay. It's it's not like the nasal tests for the COVID infection. Those tests tend to be fairly accurate if they're positive, but the serology of the immune globulins from prior infection may have a false positive because coronavirus and cold viruses are relatives. So you can do the tests. Um, and I would talk to that individual's provider, right? And then you just have to assess whether or not it's helpful in the treatment course. The bottom line is you're gonna treat the disease anyway. So you're not gonna necessarily treat the COVID cause it's over, right? I mean, it's, and uh, uh, cause it was in the, in the past. I hope that makes sense. The stuff can be confusing. <laughs> yeah, I know it's still fresh off the <laughs> paper, you know, it's for research and everything. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Great thank question. you, Candy. Yes, thank you so much for that great question. Um, moving to a couple uh, questions in the Q and A box. Uh, Jackie Pearson asked a, a really good question. What kind of menstrual irregularities are occurring? Could this also be vaccine related? Possibly, although the the in regards to the vaccine. Um, the studies that I've seen haven't shown particular menstrual irregularities. And I think with more data, we'll know better. But certainly with wild type of virus infections of coronavirus, what we see is stopping of the menstruation, heavy menstruation, light menstruation. <laughs> Part of that is because the lining of the uterus has those ACE receptors, I think, like the gut does, like, um, like the, the uh, lungs do, which is what coronavirus likes to adhere to. However, having said that, I am not a clinical expert in this regard, but I can tell you that I've seen it clinically. So ladies having it's very reassuring to my patients when I say, yes, you skipped a period, you just had COVID, let's just watch carefully, right? And just monitor those patients, make sure their thyroid's okay, those other things. But I can see menstrual irregularities and it can be all over the board, all kinds of different symptoms. Thank you so much for answering that question, Dr. Sure. Skelly. Um, Ruth Dudley had another question in the Q&A box. Is long COVID included in the list of disabilities under ADA? I don't think and it is yet. Yeah. And would it be allowable for healthcare providers to refer patients to SSI for benefit? So what happens, how that works is that if they have underlying conditions and they're becoming more debilitated, then you just refer them for their fatigue, their disability, their deconditioning, their um, diabetes, their hypertension, their the underlying other diseases that tend. So for example, if chronic long haul COVID caused kidney failure, then you can refer them for the kidney failure. So there's some loopholes there, but you just have to individualize it. And um, you could say that they have that one diagnosis that I put on there, the 
the post-acute blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Let me remember what that was on the slide and I'll chat it in. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. I know um, we had a question come in from Ron Allen. Um, what should one consider in terms of employment barriers for those with long COVID? Well, it's sometimes with my patients, it's hard for them to uh, get to all their appointments if they're working, because if you got three or four specialists involved and they have symptoms when they're up and around and fatigued because they're so orthostatic or dizzy, um, what we need to do is really try to prioritize their, their treatment. So I feel like barriers to employment include their physical symptomology. So their ability to focus, follow through with tasks, um, get to work, stand at work <laughs> without symptoms. Um, you know, it could be shortness of breath and their need for oxygen. It's just an individualized kind of thing. I hope that makes sense and answered your question. Thank you so much. And uh, we had a uh, Darren asked a question in the chat and then I will finish out the Q&A session with Roderick who raised his hand. So um, Darren typed out his question. We have a number of community members who began taking vitamin D early in the pandemic. We encourage them to come in and talk with their provider about the dosing. However, because it's over the counter, we have a fair number taking five to 10,000 IU per day. That dose seems high for a supplemental dose. What are your what are your thoughts, Dr. Kelly? I tend to defer to um, the recommended daily allowance. Um, the thing about vitamin D is is that it can be stacked in seven days. So meaning you don't have to take it every day, you can take it once a week. So if it's five to 10,000, that would be between 50 and 70,000 I use per week. And so, um, so the only way to really know what your vitamin D level is, is to have it drawn. And the goal is generally I think of it between 50 and 70. Some people say to push it higher, but that's that's experimental as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, so it's the US recommended daily allowance is 600 I use per day, but most of us are deficient. And that's where the five to 10,000 IU comes in. It is safe in my patients. I recommend um, a 50,000 IUs per week for 12 weeks for replenishment of a low vitamin D and then recheck their vitamin D. Hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. And we have one last question. Uh, Roderick, I have unmuted, asked you to unmute. You can now ask your question. While Audrey. we're waiting for him to unmute, I just wanted to mention that I really appreciate Davida Carr correcting me in regards to long COVID can be listed as a disability under the ADA section 504, section 1557, according to HHS. Okay, it's a little bit of alphabet soup there, but that's great. So I appreciate your insight. You know, as a practicing physician, I'm learning all the time, so I appreciate it. And it looks like Roderick typed in his, oh, he just unmuted. Yeah, I just found that, sorry. <laughs> what would you encourage those that remain reluctant to get vaccinated despite efforts to support COVID vaccination? So what I would encourage is that we explore what their concerns are. And what it boils down to for me as a provider having this dialogue daily for, for you know months on end is, the wild type virus is much more dangerous than the vaccine, and that's the bottom line. It can be an individualized choice that people make, but it's a choice that affects the rest of us. So I encourage them to explore their concerns, particularly with a trusted provider, 
And um, I oftentimes encourage them to think about who also is in their circle. So who's in their community that might be vulnerable, that if they're shedding virus or if they get sick themselves, um, that they can develop these sequelae or are more likely to suffer from long-term or more severe disease. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the information that you've shared. Thank you. It's my pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone so much for an engaging um, and informative webinar today. Um, you know, we have come to the end of our time and I want to just extend such a heartfelt thank you to Dr. Kelly Herr um, for lending us her wisdom, um, her expertise, uh, her vast knowledge, and um, as well as everyone here for joining us. I, I know we have not gotten feedback from everyone, but we welcome your input following this call. Please feel free to share your additional comments in the text box of the webinar portion, <clears throat> and please fill out the evaluation that we will send out to you after the webinar ends. The link to the evaluation is also in the um, Zoom chat for your convenience. Please feel free to email us with additional comments or concerns after the webinar. You can reach Munez at M-A-K-B-R-A-N at NIHB.org. She has also put her email in the uh, Zoom chat. So again, thank you all for your time today. Stay safe and until we meet again, thank you.